So what you do is really interesting. Your research centers around the nature of morality in the light of evolution and how it varies from culture to culture. So could you just explain in basic terms what your research entails and why it's beneficial? Yeah, so I'm interested in, in morality and the difference between right and wrong. Uh, what is this distinction? Where does it come from? How do people, uh, how do people know it and how does it vary around the world? Uh, obviously, people have been gnawing away at this question for millennia, philosophers and scholars and, and theologians, yeah. uh, and come to a variety of conclusions. But now I think we have we can we can bring the full weight of, of science to bear on this question to try and explain what this stuff is, what what morality is, and, and how it works. Uh, and I think that the now the, the sort of best account we have of morality is that it's a it's a set of solutions to problems of cooperation. It's a set. It's a collection of of cooperative rules for for promoting different types of cooperative behaviour. For, um, for for promoting the common good. That's the key word, isn't it? Cooperation. Yeah, cooperation, and that's uh, and that's really that's really central, and that's what's doing all the explanatory work. And I should I should emphasise that often when when uh, people talk about cooperation and, and game theory, they, they immediately think of the of prisoner's dilemma and reciprocity, and that's one important domain of cooperation and one that's been studied a lot. Um, but it's not the only game. It's not the only cooperative game. There's a whole range of different non-zero sum games, games where there can be uh, mutual benefit, where there's a win-win interaction, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's coordination games and there's uh, assurance games and uh, hawk dove games and which relate to uh, resolving conflicts in, uh, in peaceful ways. So there's a whole range of different types of cooperation or non-zero sum games to be technical uh, and a whole range of different solutions and it's these, uh, these solutions that to some, to to a large extent, we've uh, we've evolved and come and, and come naturally to us, um, but also solutions that we've invented and bolstered, bolstered through culture. Is this these range of cooperative strategies that we call morality? What made you interested in this subject of morality in the first place? Um, well, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a, a mixture of things. So. The first time I remember getting really interested in, in morality was uh, playing a board game called Scruples, and it's a oh, it's, yeah. it's a kind of I guess it's an ethical version of of uh, Trivial Pursuit, where you have to you you pose a moral dilemma to someone, and then you have to try and predict what they would say. Yes, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah it's, I think it's I think it's still I've got a copy. It's, I think it's still available. And I remember one in particular. There was a question of this is kind of pre seatbelts, but it was you just bought a new car and you only have one seatbelt in it, and you're doing the school run and picking up your kid and your friend's kid, uh, who do you put in the seatbelt? I remember uh, feeling kind of sick, not knowing what the right answer was to, should you, as it were, should you help your own kid or should you help your friend's kid? Um, and just thinking, well, how, did, how do people, how do, et cetera, with all the other moral dilemmas, and how do people, uh, what, why is this such a dilemma? Why do people, um, experience these strong uh, feelings one way or the other? Why do people think it's so important? Um, and how do they decide? How do people decide what the right thing to do is? What is the right thing to do? Uh, so I think that was one of the earliest, My early, I was a sort of early teenager, that was when I think it really piqued my interest, thinking I'd really like to, it seems like quite an important thing to understand, I'd like to get to the bottom of this. Um, and I think the other uh, the other uh, motivation was I was I was also very interested in in politics, and uh, I was a kind of teenage communist and was thought that seemed like a very uh, seemed like a good idea seemed like a very interesting idea, but I wasn't sure, and I wanted to, I went to university to do politics to try and um, better understand the difference between different political systems and political theories and. Uh, find out which one was the best, as it were. And p political theory very quickly becomes moral philosophy with questions about justice and rights and, uh, and freedom and things. And, and moral philosophy very quickly becomes debates about human nature. Are people naturally social or naturally selfish? Are they, uh, are they noble savages or is life nasty, brutish and short in the state of nature? So very, so very quickly I found myself talking to people who were talking about uh, human nature, and I thought it seemed obvious to me that if you're if you're going to do that, why start with 
ancient Greek theories of human nature. Uh, why not make use of the latest and best insights for for how people work that were coming at the time that were coming from evolutionary psychology, from game theory, uh, from primatology. Uh, if you want, if you want to understand human nature, you make use of the best science. You don't, uh, you don't read uh, very old books, yeah. except for exactly the same with chemistry. If you wanted to, if you wanted to develop a new medicine or build a new bridge, you wouldn't start with Aristotle's theory of elements. You'd mm. use the periodic table. So I, my sense was, if you want to understand morality, you should understand uh, the, the latest and best accounts of human social behaviour. So you didn't have any kind of religious upbringing, I take it, or did you? No, no, not really. Um, my my parents, my family weren't uh, weren't particularly religious. Although I did go to a, a Roman Catholic primary school, which was a bit of an eye opener, and uh, and I, I had a very uh, a very evangelical squash teacher at my secondary school, who I had uh -huh. long productive arguments with. So I so. Um, yeah, the, the 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 Roman Catholic school was uh, was unusual. It was it was run by monks in their in their cassocks, and because I was notionally C of E, I was always kind of in the back row for the RE lessons, and we had a mass every Friday morning. Yeah, and so I was very much I was seeing all see all, seeing it all go on, seeing the mass go on, but very much as a sort of outside observer, and I would think. What's going on here? Why is my PE teacher wearing a purple robe and, and yeah. mumbling <laughs> incantations about about wafers? And why were my schoolmates, um, you know, filing up to the front to go? It was just very really baffling to me why people were doing this. Uh, and so uh, it didn't make me for or against it, as it were. But I just thought it was a it was a strange thing for everyone to be doing. Well, religious people, they, they say to me all the time that you cannot be moral without a God, that you have to have a perfect standard to hold yourself up to. So, Oliver, if a religious person were to say that to you, what would your response be? Well, it's just, I mean, I, it's not true. There, uh, there isn't, as far as we know, there isn't a God, and yet people, are, people can be very moral. So, obviously, you don't need uh, a God to be moral because we're doing, we're doing okay without one. Um, in terms of, uh, do you need a belief in a god to be moral? Again, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Lots, there's, there's no huge difference between believers and non-believers when it comes to their uh, their behaviour. This objective moral standard they keep going on about, though. So, what, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, well, again, so that's um, so the worry is that if there, if there's no god, then there's no objective standard, and people will people will behave any way they want, or they'll, they'll invent any old kind of morality and, uh, and decide to do all kinds of horrible things. Um, so that's, that's an understandable fear, but uh, it's, again, it's, it's misplaced because all, all moral systems propose some objective standard. Uh, if, you, if you take a cooperative view of morality, then the, the moral criterion is whether something is cooperative or not, whether something promotes the common good or not. And whether a particular behaviour promotes the common good is is true or not, irrespective of how you feel about it. So that provides a kind of independent, objective standard of of the right thing to do. Alternatively, if you if you're utilitarian and you think that the the right thing to do is to promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number, that's an objective criterion, independent of how you feel about it. Some things do promote happiness, some things don't. Uh, and that's, a sta that's an objective standard that you can measure your and other people's behaviour by. Uh, so you, you, know, you do a bit of, you do some arithmetic and, f and figure out what the, uh, what the best thing to do is. So looking for some objective moral standard is a, is a perfectly reasonable impulse, but there are um, many sort of reasonable, available, sensible alternatives to the view that it must be some, must have some uh, supernatural status, and I'm no I'm no biblical st scholar, but it's not clear that um, it's not clear that the the God of the Bible uh, really provides uh, a kind of admirable, uh, let alone perfect moral standard. Um, a lot of the Bible, obviously the the Old Testament, is 
to a large extent, a sort of genocide manual for how one tribe can uh, rape and pillage and overthrow yeah. another. It's a it's a catalogue of uh, all kinds of horrors. the Ten Commandments are like the first four. I think are worship me and no one else. <laughs> yeah. The, the, so yeah, the first ones are Obedience. believe in me and yeah. and and, um, and the rest are pretty pretty mundane, pretty ordinary. Uh, rules for organising society that, that pretty much every society around the world um, uh, acknowledges. So it's not, and obviously there's some good there's some good bits in the in the Bible, like there's good bits in in all kinds of uh, all kinds of books. Um, but it's not it's not clear to me that that it that the the biblical the Christian uh, God provides a perfect moral standard, um, and and nor do people really follow what it says to do in the Bible, they, they pick and choose the good bits, largely on the basis of uh, what promotes what promotes the common good, what meets their uh, intuitions about how to how to cooperate, how to get along. But the idea that God just happens to agree with them, so, uh, and yeah, vice versa. Yeah, exactly. Well, they t- I think, uh, so one view is that people just project their, uh, yeah. their moral sentiments, their moral views onto some authoritative uh, alpha male in the sky. Right. So, do you do you get any pushback from religious people on this, or or not? Or is it no, has it yet to happen? Um, I I haven't. I get the occasional what used to be called green ink letters, uh, occasional emails, ranting and raving, but um, not as many as I would like. So I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping that the I'm hoping that in in putting forward, uh, helping to advance the the scientific approach to morality will um, provoke. More of the right people, and get them to think a bit more about the, the topic. And if and if the if a byproduct of that is I get more strange letters, that would be uh, a price worth paying. Your studies found that morals are pretty consistent around the world. Uh, do you think that this is because human morality has stemmed from a kind of core morality that has evolved within our early ancestors and had and has been passed on over the eons? Yes. Yeah, so I think. Yes, that's partly the case. I think that the deeper point is that morality is about cooperation. It's about solving collective action problems and coordination problems. Um, and whether it evolved or not, I think it, it did to a large extent. Um, the point is that all people everywhere in social groups face these similar kinds of problems. And so they've evolved or invented or developed uh, similar kinds of solutions, similar kinds of moral rules um, for solving them. Um, and we, yeah, we were interested in to what extent are evolved moral rules universal? Are they? Do we find them all over the world? Um, so we, um, we were inter- as I said before. So we're, the argument is that because there's different types of cooperation, there's different types of morality. So kin altruism gives rise to duty of care to your children and aversion to incest. Uh, mutualism give, gives rise to group loyalty and conformity, uh, um, exchange or reci- reciprocal altruism gives rise to a whole suite of um, moral dispositions like uh, trust and reciprocity and uh, gratitude, guilt, apology, forgiveness. Um, and there's a whole range of ways of resolving conflicts like having, uh, having ritual contests rather than coming to blows, um, dividing resources rather than demanding all of it and respecting prior possession. And these different strategies give rise to uh, costly signals of of prowess and power, like uh, bravery and fortitude and and generosity and conspicuous charity. Um, It gives rise to signals of deference and humility and abnegation and quietude. And it gives rise to fairness and property rights. So we have a whole range of different explanations for different types of morality. And we, we wanted to know to what extent these types of morality were found all around the world, or was this just a Western view of, uh, of what's moral? Are there some cultures out there that have a completely, completely different view? Um, they think completely different things are, are good and bad. So you probably expected some weird stuff to show up. Yeah, exactly. Well, so we, we wanted to see, um, we wanted to see how, how prevalent these were and how widespread they were, and if they were just in some places and not others. So my colleagues and I analysed the uh, ethnographic accounts of ethics from from the archives. So we looked at over uh, 600 sources describing the ethics of 60 cultures around the world, 
um, to see whether they thought these types of behaviours were morally good, these seven behaviours, and to, to see how widespread they were, to see how they were distributed. And we found, to our surprise, we found in 99.9% .9 of cases where these behaviours had a moral valence, they were always positive. Uh, these, these seven cooperative behaviours were always considered morally good, always considered the, uh, the right thing to do. The, the sole exception was one account where uh, theft was con open theft was considered admirable because it showed how brave the thief was. So even in the one case where uh, unusually theft was considered good, it was only because it was, there was a That falls conflict. under the bravery category. Yeah, there was a conflict. So in that case, yeah. bravery trumped theft under s special circumstances. So, but in the other 99.9% .9 of cases, these behaviours were considered morally good. Uh, we found examples of most of them in most places, and they were evenly distributed all over the all over the world in all the across all the continents. So it wasn't the case that this cooperative view of morality was just a, uh, a local, modern, recent Western invention. It was it seemed to be um, fairly universal. And again, that's because we because people basically face the same kind of problems and use the same kinds of solutions to uh, resolve them. What about moral relativism, this idea that more, what is moral and right for one group may not be moral and right within another group? For instance, conservative and religious groups think that homosexuality is harmful to society, while others, like liberal progressive groups, see it as an example of diversity and something that's strengthening to society. Right, so there's a couple of things to say about that. So. One is that although we found there were some universal moral principles, mm -hmm. it wasn't our impression that morals everywhere were identical. Uh, on the contrary, they seemed to vary, different cultures varied in how they prioritised or ranked these different moral values, especially when they came into conflict. Uh, and that's pretty much what you'd expect, because if, if moral values reflect the value of different types of cooperation, then different societies that, uh, with different social organisations, would place a different emphasis on different, endorse different moral rules uh, more strongly. So if you live in a society where most of your interactions are with kin in a big extended family, then you might expect family values to loom larger than a society like ours where we uh, live in atomized, uh, mm. small atom, either on our own or in, in small nuclear families. Uh, most of our interactions are with, uh, with strangers which, in which exchange and fairness are considered more important moral values. So even when you have the universal principles, this predicts and accommodates lots of cross-cultural variation. Um, when it comes to specific issues like homosexuality, I'm not entirely sure why people are um, morally, why some people are morally opposed to homosexuality. Uh, we, we didn't, that wasn't the focus of, the, of this particular study. Um, I suspect it's for a whole range of reasons, but it also draws attention to the, the, your, the question draws attention to the fact that sometimes people have the same values, but they have different beliefs about the consequences of particular actions. So it might be that everybody is, a, is against actions that harm others, and some people have the incorrect view, or would argue that homosexual behaviour harms others, therefore it is bad, whereas another person who has the same value that harming is bad um, doesn't take that uh, it, view. Um, it might also be like, that. this will inevitably lead to that, and people will be yeah. marrying their dogs and whatever. I mean, yes. I, I've so, heard that, you know, so yes. is that part of it? Well, yes, yeah, I mean, to the extent that your, uh, your moral views depend on your view of the consequences, yeah. then uh, if you, that's a kind of empirical claim that doing this will have these bad consequences, um, and people, people, empirical claims are amenable to evidence and testable, and they can be right or wrong, and people can people can uh, disagree about. Have you got any projects at the, at the moment, or anything, any lectures that uh, you might want to uh, publicise or talk about? No, um, I've got a long to-do list um, of projects. So, we, uh, I'd like to do more comparative anthropology, looking at the, mm. the, the prevalence of these different moral rules around the world. Um, I'd like to investigate whether and to what extent we can incorporate sexual morality into this cooperative framework. Uh, is sexual morality, like you say, homosexuality, infidelity, chastity, masturbation, onanism, the whole, 
uh, yeah. the whole shebang. Uh, is is this a completely separate domain of morality with, with its own rules, uh, or is it just a collection of? Uh, is it just more cooperation? Is it co is it a set of rules for promoting cooperation within and between the sexes? Uh, so I'd like to get a better handle uh, on that. And uh, we are. I've also developed um, a new moral values questionnaire assessing the importance people place on these, these seven different moral values. So we're using that to uh, look at the relationship between morality and political views and uh, business ethics and environmental, uh, environmental ethics. So we're, uh, we're following up the implications um, in that direction. Um, we have, have some funding to look at the genetic and neural basis of these different moral dispositions. So that that's coming down the pipe. Is that literally looking point. at the brain and what's going on inside the brain? Uh, it's it's looking at whether there's um, uh, correlations between the self-report moral values and uh, activity in different brain regions. Yeah. So do you think do you think the world is getting more cooperative? Uh, I th yeah, um, I think it is. Um, if and uh, don't take my word for it. Stephen Pink has a good summary of uh, of how the world has become a much better, more cooperative, more sympathetic, um, and consequently more prosperous place um, in his book *The Better, Better Angels of Our Nature*. So, uh, yeah, I think we're doing we're doing okay. Excellent. So, if people want to see more of your work, they can find you on YouTube and Twitter, and I'll put links to those in the description below. So, all is left to say is, Oliver, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you.